In last week's episode, we met a young girl named Erin inside of Vault 81, who asked us to go out into the Commonwealth and find her runaway cat named Ashes. We ended up finding the curious little fella sitting near some docks on the outskirts of Chestnut Hillock Reservoir, at which point we told it to go home and chased it back into the vault. But while we were out looking for Aaron's cat, we didn't have much of a chance to explore the reservoir and the buildings that surround it, which is why I decided to dedicate today's video to doing just that. Just for good measure, we can start right outside of Vault 81 and then make our way around the reservoir counterclockwise. After jumping down a rocky ledge, we first come across a house with a motorcycle out in front, but it's completely boarded up so there's no way to get inside. Traveling southeast, we come to a couple of blood bugs hovering above what looks to be a dead Brahmin. After taking them out, we see that it was in fact a Brahmin that the bugs were feasting on, only this poor creature in particular had a name, Bess. It must have had an owner. Perhaps we can find more information inside of this house up ahead. The first thing we see upon entry is a symbol monkey, which activates and then draws the attention of a couple of rad roaches. In a connecting room, we find a large red couch and a master lock safe sitting in the northern corner. Inside is a rather generous amount of loot, including a fragmentation mine, a Molotov cocktail, some Radex, a stealth boy, and a silver pocket watch. In the eastern corner of the room is a duffel bag filled with ammunition and a rifle, sitting on top of a nearby table or a few bottle caps, and on yet another table in the southern corner of the room, we find an entire stash of caps. Heading into the kitchen, we really don't find anything of interest on the counter, but sitting on a nearby shelf is some turpentine, some psycho, jet, and rataway. Looks like whoever lived here may have been hooked on chems. On a desk near the entrance of the house, we find several empty bottles of Nuka-Cola and Edwin's Terminal. On it, we are given access to six different logs, starting with September 7th, 2287, and ending on September 17th, 2287. The first entry reads, Bess and I got in just before sundown. Old place is still in one piece, though the north side sunk a little more. Need to shore it up the next time I'm out this way. Spring? Whole place has been trashed, though. Damn raiders. Take me a week or two to get it cleaned out again. On September 12th, 2287, Edwin wrote, Forgot how nice it was to get off the road. Bess seems to be settling in well, too. Hard to believe it's been ten years. I still remember Anika leveling that shotgun at me. What an introduction. Think we're both glad she never pulled the trigger. So it sounds like Edwin was a traveler drifting from place to place around the wasteland for an entire decade with his Brahmin, Bess, by his side. After getting tired of life out on the road, Edwin decided to come back home. We can also assume that Anika was Edwin's wife, who apparently at one time came close to blowing off his head with a shotgun. The third entry on the terminal reads, Couple of bloat flies bothering Bess this morning. Chase them off, nasty things. Spent the afternoon rigging up a zapper with parts from the old generator. Seems to work well enough. One jolt of that ought to keep them away for good. Just one day later, Edwin wrote, Shooting stars tonight. Sat on the deck and watched them, just like we used to. She's been gone three winters now. All I've got left is her locket and this old place. She deserved better. And then on September 17th, Edwin wrote, Out fishing when the bugs came back. Bloat flies and worse. Hell of a swarm. I got a couple of good shots off, but upset the boat. Had to swim back. I think I drove them off, or at least for now. Bess is spooked, but she'll be alright. If this keeps up, we'll leave first thing in the morning. Leave first thing in the morning? You've only been here for a week, Edwin. Those bloat flies must have been pretty bad. But later on that same day, Edwin hopped back onto the terminal and wrote, I can't find the locket. It must have slipped out of my pocket when the boat flipped over. I have to go back. It's all I got to remember her by. I can't lose it, too. To investigate further into this mysterious missing locket, we can head out to the dock in front of Edwin's house, and sure enough, there's an overturned boat not far from shore. I decided to exit my power armor so that I could move around easier underwater, 
and since I have the Aqua Boy perk, I didn't have to worry about running out of air. Once we're directly underneath the boat, we can dive down to the bottom of the reservoir where we find a skeleton. These must be the remains of Edwin. But how did he die? There's a first aid kit nearby, a cooler with some Medex and Edwin's key, and right next to Edwin's right hand, we find Anika's locket. But as soon as we take it, we start getting hit with some kind of projectile. There is only one possible explanation. The bloat flies and their disturbing ability to launch their own larva from their abdomen. Swimming back to shore, we can take out our shotgun and blow them away. Now we know how Edwin met his fate. He dove down to the bottom of the reservoir to retrieve Anika's locket, but before he even had a chance to swim back to shore, he was attacked by bloatflies just like we were. The only difference is that Edwin wasn't as lucky. Continuing around the perimeter of the reservoir, we eventually come to a house with a blood bug perched on the outer wall. After blasting it away, we can loop around to the front of the house where we find Jangles the Moon Monkey sitting in a chair on the porch. You know, I found another one of these in the Secret Vault 81, and they're not getting any less creepy. On the opposite end of the porch, we find a rather strange looking scene, a skeleton lying on top of a sleeping bag surrounded by seven bottles of wine. Nearby, there's some Psycho, a box of Mentats, some bobby pins, and a cooler with some ammunition inside. Looks like our guy here was a gunslinging, booze-drinking druggie. But how did he die? There's a number of possible explanations, but the one I think is most likely is that this guy was homeless, wandering the streets of the Commonwealth with nothing but his booze, his drugs, and a sleeping bag. On the night before the bombs dropped, he decided to set up camp on the porch of an abandoned house, and then died Saturday morning as he was trying to sleep off a head-throbbing hangover. After leaving the porch, Curie begins firing at something. I wasn't sure what at first, but after looking up, we get our answer. Super mutants on top of a tall, nearby building. There's only one way to get out of situations like this, and that's through the use of high explosives. For some reason, Curie didn't like when I fired my big boy, so I decided to talk to her to see if I could find out why. Your thoughts? It is a shame these super mutants force us to dispatch them. That's all for now. Not a problem. Let us continue our journey. It's then that I remembered that Curie spent the last 200 years inside of Vault 81, meaning that this little trip around Chestnut Hillock Reservoir is her very first experience out in the Commonwealth. She's never seen super mutants before, and she doesn't know that in order to survive out in the wasteland, sometimes you have no choice but to defend yourself against them. In a nearby dumpster, we find a couple of fusion cells, and on a brick wall next to it are three pre-war posters. The walls have eyes. Communists are watching. The walls have ears. Communists are listening. Be vigilant. Communism is coming. Given the fact that there was a heavy military presence just before the bombs dropped, it makes sense why the people of the Commonwealth would have feared a communist takeover. Traveling north, we find an old rowboat on our left with some wooden crates next to it, but no good loot. I decided to take another trip into the depths of the reservoir to see if I could find anything of interest. Sure enough, I did. Inside of what looks to be a submerged van, we find a steamer trunk filled with a wide variety of weapons and ammunition. Continuing our stroll around the reservoir, we eventually come to yet another bizarre scene. A skeleton lying inside of a bathtub with a bottle of Nuka-Cola Quantum clutched in his hand. On the ground next to the tub is a female mannequin and a camera. How on earth are we supposed to explain this one? Of course, it's entirely possible that this scene was staged by raiders, but personally, 
I believe that this guy accepted his fate upon hearing the news that the missiles had launched and wanted to go out in style, relaxing inside of a bathtub with a pair of shades, a cold Nuka Cola, and a girl by his side. Now that's a guy that we could all learn a thing or two from. There's another skeleton lying on a muddy bank by the reservoir, and yet another skeleton in a wheelchair. On a dock to the west is a fourth skeleton, who was fishing and enjoying a few beers when the bombs dropped. Inside of a cooler next to him, we can loot some Nuka Cherry and some canned dog food. I'm sure dog meat will be happy to hear about this. As we circle back to our starting point, there's not much of interest other than a coffee tin floating on a wooden board just offshore. I'm not exactly sure how to explain that one. And to the northwest, a pre-war restaurant called Joe's Spuckies. The large sign on top touts the company's catering service and a large meatball sub and tonic for $55. And I thought spending $7 at Subway was expensive. Heading inside, we find a skeleton lying on the floor and a cash register with some pre-war money inside. Other than a few more skeletons, some mugs, plates, and other miscellaneous items, there isn't much here. Just the scorched and deteriorating remains of what was likely a thriving company before the bombs dropped. And with that, we can make our way up towards Vault 81 where we first started our adventure. I have to admit, I wasn't expecting there to be this much lore on the outskirts of Chestnut Hillock Reservoir, and I was pleasantly surprised to see that I was wrong. It goes to show that Bethesda really took the time to make a living and breathing world for us to explore, with stories and tales of the past hidden around every corner. But I'd love to know what you think, folks. Which piece of lore did you enjoy most as we made our way around Chestnut Hillock Reservoir? Because we know that Edwin was a traveler, have you heard his name mentioned anywhere else in the Fallout 4 universe? And what about the skeleton we found out on the porch? Do you think he died when the bombs dropped, or did he pass away sometime afterwards, perhaps due to alcohol poisoning or drug overdose? Let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video, consider clicking on the thumbs up icon below to show your support, or better yet, subscribe to my channel so that you can stay up to date on all of my latest content. I post new videos on Fallout every single Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen, so be sure to check back next week for more Fallout lore, commentary, and analysis. For those who are fans of The Elder Scrolls, I also put out lore videos on Skyrim every single Friday so be sure to check those out as well. But that's all for now, folks. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time.